Welcome chemistry students to our second podcast in this chapter on uh, matter and now we're going to talk a little bit about changes and there are a couple kinds physical changes and chemical changes and it occurs to me Mr. Sustin that there's actually two things going on there. This is a wisely chosen photograph there are examples of both physical and chemical changes occurring in this picture and uh, if we let the students take a moment think about it while we change slides. It's kind of nice that we actually thought ahead to provide such a fantastic example for them. Well, we work hard. Yes, it's, yes we do. It's 7 o'clock at night here at West <laughs> Young High School, and we're still here. Right. So, what is it about physical changes? Physical changes involve things like size, shape, state, phase, similar there. We often think of that as changes that can be easily reversed, but I don't want you guys to think of it as things that can be undone easily and just keep it that simple. Yeah. Now, sometimes that description works, but we do need to start thinking about it in a little more detail. Um, is there an example? Give an example. Sure. If you, if you broke uh, a beaker on the lab floor, um, have, have, you, have you really made anything new? I mean, besides a mess, right. have you really made anything new? No, you've just changed the size and shape of that beaker. Can you get the beaker back? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you could. It's not going to be easy. And, right. But you could, you could melt that beaker down, which is a physical change, right. and reform it into the shape of a beaker and get your beaker back. Sure. So it's reversible. But there are other physical changes that I think are not... Uh, quite so easily reversible, yet it's still a physical change. And what always occurs to me is slicing a birthday cake. Right. You, you can't know. undo that. You can't uncut a cake. Right. Um, it's still cake, though. It's just not one larger piece of cake right. anymore. But you could cover the crack over with frosting. Oh, yeah, that'd be really good. Yeah. Be what, really good. what was, go, go back one slide. What okay. was that phase word? Oh. What do you mean by phase? That's phase. worth going over. Yeah, I think so. So when we're talking about phases, as opposed to just states of matter, we're talking about the form that that matter is in a system. So you may have a glass of iced tea, where you have uh, the tea in the liquid phase, that's one phase, and then you have ice cubes in there, right. the solid, that's another phase, you have the glass itself, that's another phase. Um, so kind of think of the term phase along those lines. And of course, you're going to be investigating in your book and some assignments to help you refine your understanding of this a little bit further. Right. So some students have a tough time with that. Okay. So uh, chemical properties and changes are very different from physical changes. Right. Chemical properties, again, describe the way one substance behaves in the presence of another. I think we mentioned that in our yes. other video. Yeah. Yeah. For example, uh, oxygen, we all know, oxygen reacts with iron and forms rust. And, uh, you know, I've, I've driven through the student parking lot. Yeah. And there's some, there's some pretty yeah. rusty cars out there. Yeah. And that happens here in northeastern Ohio because of all the road salt, which actually helps that chemical change occur. And it's a combination with oxygen. And you get a new substance. It's flaky. It's orange has its own unique set of properties that it didn't it didn't have before. But that's a really slow reaction. Uh, something similar that is a much faster, maybe more dramatic and exciting right. in terms of reaction is burning like this torch here. So again, we have a substance combining with oxygen. In this case, in this case, it's the fuel combining with oxygen, but it's very rapid compared to what the uh, rusting nail uh, was what was going on with the rusting nail, but yet another example of this chemical change. And how do we know that? Well, if we could collect all the gases and things given off from it and trap it somehow, it'd be a little bit tricky, but it can be done, we would see new substances at the atomic and molecular level. So when you're thinking chemical change, try to visualize that at the atomic molecular level and there's been some rearrangement that creates new material when we're looking at chemical changes. Right. 
and, and again with chemical changes, you always create something new and unique that wasn't there before. Um, the new substance has its own unique set of properties that can be remarkably different from the properties of the substances that combined to make it. For example, uh, sodium chloride. Right. Everybody puts sodium chloride on their french fries. We eat it every day. But sodium, as a chemical element, mm -hmm. is explosive yeah. and toxic. And chlorine... We should do something with that in class. We probably will. And chlorine is a, is a horribly toxic green gas. Very but scary. if... Yeah, but if you combine them to make sodium chloride, we have to have sodium chloride every day in our diet to stay healthy. Okay, so how do we know that? Well, you might look for some sort of color change, like when the leaves change color yeah. in the fall. Which will happen here in a few weeks. Yeah, yeah. Or other sort of heat and light given off. Right, or, or other forms of energy, like with these, these chemical glow sticks. Uh, everybody's played with these. It's, it's two different chemicals on the inside, and you have to snap that barrier, and then they mix and produce light. It's a chemical change. And we'll get into that particular reaction a little bit more in a later chapter. And there are other pieces of evidence of chemical changes as well. The production of a gas, fizzing the effervescing of, of an Alka-Seltzer tablet in a, a water. Any time a chemical reaction occurs, it's important to know that mass is conserved. During a chemical reaction, no mass is created or destroyed. Mr. Sustin, you're, you're big into nature yes. and environmental science. Does that mean we are saving mass for use by our grandchildren's grandchildren? Yes. Really? Yes. Okay, so we're going to collect all this mass and preserve it somehow? Yes. We're going to keep it in the freezer down in the cafeteria. <laughs> the mass of useful material isn't necessarily conserved because, you know, we're constantly, for example, burning down the rainforest. All the mass of those trees is not necessarily being conserved as trees. It's being released into the atmosphere as water vapor and carbon dioxide. And in a sense, to someone who hasn't taken high school chemistry, they might think that that mass has gone away. Oh. But if we could trap that. Like you were saying before. Right, if we could put it like a big container around the rainforest when it burnt and collect all those gases and things and mass those, then we would see that we'd have all that material again. Now this law of conservation of mass is important. It's our first law of nature in chemistry. And it's important that you understand how that governs a lot of what we're going to be discussing really for the rest of the year. And this idea of mass of reactants equaling the mass of the products is an important one that you will see time and time again uh, as we go into stoichiometry and so on. Stoichi what? Stoichiometry. Whatever. Yeah, very cool.